All right. It's our chapter on industrialization bonus round. We're looking at unions for a minute here. So we have a little bit more to say dealing with unions. Why were unions needed back in this time? We know unions are very widespread today, although they are somewhat in decline. Working conditions. Working conditions. Back then, they didn't have safety standards. There was no OSHA that was making sure that your workplace was safe. Okay, that didn't exist. So what we had instead, we had dangerous working conditions. We're going to see during the study of the Progressive Era, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire is the worst example of this, where a bunch of people die because they're actually the emergency exits were basically chained shut. So working conditions are poor. Miners are working in dangerous jobs. Many industrial workers worked in places where they could have injuries, and there was no workman's comp back then. There was none of that. You were just out on the street if you had a problem like that. Hours. People sometimes work 10, 12, or 14 hours a day, six days a week. That's a lot of working. The people who start to organize unions are looking for eight-hour work day. Company towns. Sometimes businesses would open their own. This is kind of going off of the uh, model of Lowell, Massachusetts and Walton, Massachusetts, way back with Francis Cabot Lowell in 1810 to 1820. But forming your own factory town, companies would basically have a town, they would build housing for the workers and charge them rent, they would have stores and they would have restaurants and bars and they'd have everything in the town and the company would own it all. Well here's the deal, if the company started to lower the, the wages, say oh we gotta do a wage cut, but then everything else stayed the same, or they didn't give you a wage increase but then the prices went up and were overpriced in these stores and pubs and stuff like that, you can imagine workers would go into despair thinking they can't keep up. Everything is controlled by the company. That was not very popular with workers. Child labor is another one. You not only had women working long hours, but you had kids sometimes well under 10 years old that are working sometimes 10 or 12 hours a day, sometimes being maimed or killed by the machinery or the dangerous working conditions they're working with. So those are some of the reasons why unions were going on. We start out really, before we get into organized unions, the Great Railway Strike. A bunch of union, uh, railroads in conjunction in 1877 announced they were going to do a fairly significant pay cut. So what you see is an explosion nationwide of railway workers all basically doing like a gridlock shutdown. They refuse to operate or work on any railroad lines and it shuts down nationwide. And they're going to you know, basically be resistant to efforts of those companies. Eventually you're going to see other lower class poor workers in society that are going to kind of rally to their cause and eventually President Hayes has to send out US troops to go and fight uh, or maybe they will do some fighting but to basically uh, end this, this strike and get the railway lines working again. This scared the upper class people in society to death. Well, after that, people start saying, you know what, this is working pretty well. So we get the Knights of Labor. Uh, the Knights of Labor are formed by a guy named Terrence Powderly. It's a smart operation because he's going to say, you know what, why don't we have everybody, it's a big tent. We'll have all kinds of workers can come in here and uh, they can all be a part of our one big union. His downfall is going to come around the fact that he has... In, uh, skilled workers and unskilled workers in the same union because unskilled workers of course can be easily replaced by scabs or by any unskilled person off the street so their striking is not going to be very effective. Powderly in fact didn't even really like striking, he didn't want to see that. He was uh, instead pushing to um, have other, other methods he would use. The Knights are going to be fairly successful, they become the preeminent early union in America but then the Haymarket Square bombing is going to occur at a place that they were protesting and an anarchist throws a bomb at the police and then you have massive violence. It gets blamed on the Knights. The Knights get driven out of existence uh, basically because they become very unpopular. People flee them for other choices. Uh, the American Federal... Some of the things the Knights of Labor wanted, better working conditions, eight hour work day instead of 10 or 12 hours, 14 hours. So these are, you know, common theme things that we've already seen that they're going to be interested in. American Federation of Labor kind of becomes the big tent. Some people call it the, the Labor Trust because it's going to become so big and, and comprehensive in America 
And it is going to, um, it's run by Samuel Gompers. Uh, we still have the AFL today. And it's going to be uh, pretty mainstream. It's going to be seen as more moderate. And if you look over here, kind of this political spectrum, I kind of, I hope this is helpful. The AFL would probably be your most moderate choice. They are not looking to take over. The Knights of Labor, they wanted to see, hey, what if workers owned the companies and then they profit shared them? Okay? Well, we see companies that do that sometimes today. The AFL just said, we just want some improvements. And since their goals were more moderate, Samuel Gompers, you even see all the way up to World War I, is going to be much more willing to work with big business owners. He's going to be much more willing to work with the government and he's not going to be quite as antagonistic, and that allows them to be very successful and get some of their things accomplished, some of their goals accomplished eventually, and to not kind of get a you know black eye to their their um, organization. A major strike that occurs is the Homestead strike. This shows kind of the limits of striking. Um, remember, I said the Knights of Labor didn't really believe in striking, but some of them did anyhow. Uh, but the AFL, they're okay with strikes. But strikes are not um, something that's a solution to all situations. And one way we can see this is the Homestead strike. It's a Carnegie Steel uh, mill. They're going to say they're going to have a price cut, and the workers end up uh, violently basically going on strike. And I say violently because the Pinkertons, these kind of detective slash thugs, were brought in by the ownership to kind of shut down the strike. Violence breaks out. The Pinkertons get captured and they end up sending in um, National Guard troops to shut this down and they end up basically hiring scabs to replace the workers so the homestead strike fails but it was a major notable example like the Great Railway Strike and the Haymarket Square bombing the last group we want to talk about way out here not here clear out here and if I drawn this more accurately we probably have AFL really you know really close on the left Knights of Labor would probably be a little bit closer here, way out on the edge is the IWW. The international workers of the world are basically Marxists. They're, they're early communists. They want an overthrow of the whole system. They're going to say, this system is bad. We need to get rid of the ownership class. Workers need to run the factories. This whole thing is a mess, and we need to get rid of it. And they're going to be very radical. Uh, they are also going to get in a lot of trouble. Um, up through World War I, they're going to be trying to shut down the war effort at the same time that Samuel Gompers and the uh, AFL uh, they're going to be attempting to help. Uh, they're going to, he just wants a spot at the table in the negotiations and labor gets a pretty good deal during World War I. Uh, prices go up a lot, there's a ton of jobs available with war production but the IWW and other uh, socialists and communists they're trying to disrupt the whole system and disrupt war production. They're going to end up getting jailed and persecuted under uh, the clear and present danger doctrine um, with the Sedition Act. So, um, oh, and the leader of the IWW is Big Bill Haywood. That's a pretty quick look at our major unions that we need to focus on. It's a pretty quick look at a few of the major strikes, kind of what the goals are. And really what you're going to see is, by the early 1900s, especially post-progressive era, although there are times when unions are more popular, times when they drop in popularity, you're going to see that unions are going to get a lot of these basic goals accomplished. Working conditions, there's going to be laws protecting that and improving them. Hours, you'll have the eight-hour workday. Child labor is going to pretty much get outlawed. So in all these areas, you see that the labor unions eventually have some success. That's all I've got in the bonus round. Stay classy, Sam Marlowe.